the mind of a boat builder. Boat building videos are full of plasma cutters and welders and grinders and wood saws and lumber and epoxies and it just an ongoing list and then there's thousands of components engines and drive trains and so forth but what makes up the people behind these boats if you're considering a really ambitious big project and want to join that uh, minority of builders that are doing things like that this video series is for you my name is Rhys, I'm an engineer based in the side of Ireland and I'm rebuilding a steel yacht um, and I'm hoping to sail it around the world in the next three years. I'm 28 years old and I live in the south of Ireland. Um, I'm actually originally from the UK but I moved here when I was six and um, we moved down to West Cork. So that's about, it's, it's just southwest Ireland um, and there's a huge amount of sailing down here. Um, it's actually like, there's one of the oldest sailing clubs in the world down here and uh, there's quite a lot of kind of Around the world sailors from here as well, and there was like the likes of Conor O'Brien in the early kind of 90, I think it was 1906 that he did it. it, it it's a really cool place because the yard I'm actually in. If you if you ever see the yard in my videos, it's unusual to come across somebody who isn't into around the world sailing rather than just around the cans. You know, there's a lot of like crazy individuals down there. It's like a breeding ground for crazy people. Um, to be honest, my parents because they like the two of them kind of brought me up to be very open-minded and um, to kind of, if I have an idea or something I want to do, there's absolutely no reason that I can't do it. And outside of that, it was probably Christopher Columbus. <laughs> um, she's a 38 foot steel um, sloop. So she was built in Holland, um, I think it was 1984. And she was sailed, as far as I know, she was built in Holland and brought to, registered to Basel in Switzerland, which is unusual because it's inland. Um, so she was sailed then, I think she sailed through the Mediterranean and past uh, Morocco where she was actually attacked by two wooden boat pirates and um, apparently she was bearing the scars of piracy and everything. I don't know how true that is but I'm going to go with it. And um, sailed up to where I live now in Baltimore and then she was actually, um, she had a really bad accident, she had a fire and she was um, sold to the insurance company and the, the owner left and went back to wherever he was from. I think he was from Switzerland. And um, the guy, a guy bought it and put it into a shed and kind of did little bits and bobs over the next 15 years, very little. Um, and then the guy, Nick, that I bought it off, he took it on. So he bought it, it was basically being cut up for scrap. So he bought it and the deck was completely rotten through. There was, the deck had fallen in. Um, there was two feet of water in it and she was basically, she was ready for the scrap bin. So he replaced the deck, he put a new cockpit design on it, moved the cockpit back and he bought a, um, a mast off a wrecked boat and he got a propeller and an engine off a wrecked boat as well. And um, basically he put the boat together over the next six years and then he put her, he sandblasted it, put her in primer and then kind of put her to one side because he found uh, another abandoned boat that it was pretty much finished. So he bought that, but um, she was looking for somewhere to go. And I kind of had my eye on her and when I got back from the Atlantic crossing, um, I decided to go look for a boat and we were looking at smaller fiberglass boats and we couldn't, we couldn't imagine living on them, they were too small. And I've always, always wanted steel, especially because of Ireland. and, um, you know, bumping into things and stuff just sounds a little bit better when you've got four or five mil plate steel. Um, so I saw her and I emptied my bank account and I went down and said, will you take this? <laughs> yeah, he said, fine, yeah. Um, and the, the amazing thing is he actually, um, he works on it with me quite a lot. Like he doesn't want to let it go, basically. He's, he's always there helping me. Um, so I made a really good friend as well. Um, I like the stability as well. And like fiberglass quite, is quite, it bobs quite a lot. You know, it's quite a lot lighter. Um, so it is, and it is a lot faster and I can understand why people would, um, want a faster boat, especially for long crossings. But for me, I like the extra stability of steel and there's a lot more junk in the water these days. Like there's a lot more shipping containers, a lot more, um, things like that. And it's not uncommon to bump into stuff. Um, and I don't think fiberglass would hold up as well as steel, you know, and you've never, I've never heard of a steel boat's keel fall off. So, um, and there's quite a lot of high profile keel losses on uh, fiberglass boats at the moment. And I'm kind of, it just makes me very nervous. I've never really enjoyed, uh, keel bolts. <laughs> um, plus I don't like being itchy. Um, okay. 
why not buy a boat? I could think of a lot more reasons to build a boat than buy a boat. Um, like when I stepped into Zara and she was completely gutted inside out, all I saw was potential. Whereas every time I, I kind of stepped into a, a finished boat or even a half finished boat, I was like, yeah, I, I don't really see as many possibilities, you know. So I looked at quite a, lot, uh, quite a number of boats over the last couple of years because I knew that I wanted to live on a boat and I knew I wanted to go cruising and kind of go long distance. Um, but everything I looked at was either too small or didn't really have the layout that I wanted. Um, so when I saw Zara then and I saw like that she was completely bare steel inside and all I could see was okay, I can put a tank there or I can use this for that or I can put the bunk over here and I can live in that bit. Whereas I never really felt that passionate about some, um, some of the boats that I saw that were already finished. And they always felt really small, I suppose. A lot of them were under 32 foot as well because of the, the money that people wanted for anything over the 32 foot mark was just too much. Um, because I knew that anything I bought, I would have gutted to the, back to the hull anyway. Um, so I kind of felt like I saved money by buying a boat that didn't have an interior, you know? Um, and I saved time as well. And yeah, like that's, to be honest, that's pretty much it. I, I'd never really, I've always wanted to build a boat as well. I think you should always, I think everyone in their life should build a boat, a house and a car. And I've built a boat, I'm building a boat and I build a car. So, you know, I'm on the road to it. <laughs> so for me, there was a kind of multiple phases to the project. There was like the get the boat floating and sailing and then get the boat fitted out for living, test the boat and kind of put it through its paces and then go. So there's kind of a four phase project. Um, I bought her in February of this year and now it's the, coming towards the end of July, coming into August. Um, and I kind of, when I got her, I, I'd kind of, from experience with my other boat that I was building, it just dragged on and on and on and on because I never really saw the end of it. I wish what I should have done with that, um, because I'm quite a result, results, uh, kind of quite a, a result um, based person. I like seeing things happening. Um, there's also, it's a two hour commute. So to get to the boat, it's a two hour drive. Um, which is a bit of a pain. So like I go down on the Friday and I sleep in the yard until Monday and I come back to work. Um, so for me to get her close to home, I could have spent a lot of money on a trucking, on trucking it, like craning it onto a truck, bring it up, finding a place to put it and stuff like that. Or I could have spent that extra bit of time and not really necessarily any more money making it float and actually getting her moving under her own steam. Um, so in the next maybe month, she's going to be quite close to where I work. So I'll be able to actually go there every day and actually live on it. Um, so for me, it kind of made sense to see it floating and not kind of sickness. She's been on the hard for 20 years. So she's, she needs to get water under her, you know, um, boats kind of have a soul as well, you know, like they feel happier and they feel more alive when they're moving around and bobbing and they're, they're constantly moving and, you know, you just, I don't know. I just think it's better to have it on the water. It's going to be a lot more luxurious than how I live at the moment. <laughs> I don't even have any uh, sitting headroom, so um, I'm really excited about it because it means that I can kind of come home after work, have a cup of tea and just get at it and not have to worry about kind of commuting to the shed or commuting to the boat from home or, you know, for me, it makes more sense to work on it while I live on it. Um, I can put a little bit of a a corner or a side and cover it and sleep under that. But um, I've been slumming it for over a year now in the van, so this is going to be luxury. <laughs> um, how much longer will it be? Oh, I want to say I want to say two more years from today. Um, but to be honest, I might say that in two months, and then I might say that in six months. So I'm hoping by June 2020, the boat will be have at seal uh, have at least her sea trials done, and um, be ready for a serious crossing. My background in boats is very limited, but um, my background in engineering is, I suppose, I wouldn't say extensive, but I'm, I'm, I've been an engineer for eight years, um, working with different projects. And, and yeah, I built several cars. Um, I built a few small minis and I built a Mazda MX-5 and I do all of my own uh, automotive maintenance, I suppose. And, you know, so, it's kind of, it wasn't a huge leap to jump into the boat. Um, I have been around boats for a long time. My dad was a marine engineer. Um, but to be honest, I wouldn't, I would never 
I would never say to anyone that they need any form of background in engineering or boat building or anything to do something like this. They need the balls basically to do it or whatever the female equivalent is. Um, they need to just get stuck in and do it because like you could give yourself an excuse to do nothing, you know, to do nothing and just sit around and kind of, you know, dreams are there to be had. They can't, you can't just sit around dreaming all day long. Oh, um, are you familiar with Bernard Matissier? Yeah, so he, he was once asked the question, how much a boat costs to build? And he said, all the money you have. So, you know, you, you've, what you've got to do is write down your budget and be really stringent about your budget and then throw it in the bin and just get at it because it's going to just cost and cost and cost. But that said, I have about a budget of um, about 35,000 euros. And at the moment, I'm on track. So um, if it stretches beyond that a little bit, I won't be too upset. Um, but I've been saving for about six years, so I should be okay for a little bit longer. <laughs> I, I'm an engineer, so I work uh, 40 hours a week for a medical device company. Um, so I work those 40 hours and then whatever's left I put into boat building and, and making videos. But um, Or I make a bit of money on the side as a video maker and a photographer too. Um, I do, you know, if somebody needs a hand with something, they throw me a few money, few, few euros here and there as well. And the YouTube is finally starting to make a little bit of money too. And I have a few patrons, which is which just blows my mind a little bit. But um, and the coins as well. The coins have made us good money too. So they paid for my propeller. My grandmother actually used to travel a massive amount. She'd save all her pennies and she'd she'd go off. I think one of her last trips was to the Galapagos before she passed away. So like. I guess it's kind of been bred into me to travel. My dad was a marine engineer. He he uh, travelled literally all over the world to on um, on container ships and and uh, so I guess it's kind of in my blood. Um, I'm kind of just drawn to it, and I feel like if I don't do it, I'll be forever disappointed in myself. Um, and I feel like if you if if anyone's familiar with Tim Ferriss, which most people are at this stage. Um, he says that what you should do is you should sit down and evaluate your life at the, right now and be honest with yourself and say, how long would it take me to get back to this point again if I try something else? And most of us could get back to where we are right now with not a very little amount of effort, but maybe within a year you could probably back, be back exactly where you were, but you'd have all that experience gained in between. So if for some reason this fails, which I, I can't see happening at all, then at least I'll have that experience to fall back on and I can just go back to where I am now, you know. Maybe I'll be a little bit further back in my career, but nothing ventured, nothing gained, I suppose, you know. I can't remember. So I've, I bought a camera, I think it was five years ago, and I started taking photos. And I've always loved taking photos, so my gear started building up. And then um, my same, the same friend that taught me how to sail also taught me how to make videos, Iro. So he was like really into video and I couldn't understand. I was like, he loves YouTube and he loves making videos. And I was like, um, maybe I'll try that too. And I bought a little GoPro. And um, it's actually somewhere here actually. So I bought this, uh, this GoPro and I started making videos about two years ago. Or maybe three years ago now, Frantic. And uh, they were crap, <laughs> they were really bad. And um, I started really getting into YouTube. I started watching like Jamie Mansell. I started watching all these other channels that were making stuff. And it just started picking up from there. I got addicted to seeing people watching them and people enjoying them. And I don't know, I just, just making videos started becoming a little bit second nature. So I just wanted to start videoing everything. I'd say, so I work my 40 hour week. Sometimes it's 50 hours um, if it's a busy week. And then in the evening, say after work, um, say I'll do a little bit of work, boat work in my shed that I have um, away from the boat. So I'll do maybe a few days a week, a little bit in the, in the shed in the evenings, maybe two or three hours. And then in, in the evening before I go to sleep, I might spend two hours before I go to bed just putting a bit of video together from the weekend. Um, and then on the weekends, when I'm actually working on the boat, I'll shoot video pretty much all day. I'll just grab the camera and I'll shoot whatever is going on. Um, and so I would say, I would say about 15 hours a week would be for video. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say about 15 hours per week for a video. Sometimes more if the video is a bit longer, but I think people underestimate how long it takes um, because it's very, very hard to shoot a video while you work and tell a story at the same time. Um, I kind of had, I had a, um, I have a full frame Nikon D600 that I had from doing, I used to do a lot of professional photography work for magazines and writing for magazines. 
So I had that for that. Um, but if you're gonna, so like what I have is, I'm just lucky I had it because of the profession that I was doing at the time. But to be honest, as I said, this is the first camera I had. It was 175 euro or 200 euros. It wasn't more than 200 euros. And um, I made all of my videos on this from, the, from day one. And if you have an iPhone, then you can make YouTube videos. Like it's like, I think most, I, I think most Apple computers have uh, iMovie on them or some kind of free movie maker. I was using um, GoPro Studio, which is a free piece of software. I was making all of my videos on GoPro Studio. So to say, if anybody, if anybody says that they can't make videos because they haven't got the right camera, they failed before they've even started. And that's a fact. We want to get to the South Pacific as quickly as we can. So I feel like um, I've done I've done sailing from I've sailed from um, Kashkai to Lisbon. I sailed from uh, I've sailed in Ibiza. I've sailed from the Canaries via Cape Verde to the, to the Caribbean. So I've done a little bit of that, and I kind of feel like I've si I've seen it. But um, obviously, I haven't seen half of it. But I kind of feel like it's done, so I want to move on. Um, but I want to get through the Panama Canal because it's quite expensive while well, we still have decent money and then um, we can't turn back then because we're through and we have to keep going. <laughs> so I want to see, I want to get to New Zealand, I want to get to Australia, I want to see Vanuatu, I want to see Tonga, Fiji, the Cook Islands, uh, Pitcairn Islands. I want to see all those islands that you can't get to unless you have a lot of money or a boat. So um, I feel like when we're kind of in our 50s or 60s and we've kind of, we've got, we've had our kids and we've gone round again, do you know, that we're looking at going cruising again, then we can do the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, you know. Um, but I feel like when we're young and we have a, a pretty fresh, pretty fresh boat and a bit of savings, we can head straight for the, Pan uh, for the Panama Canal and get across as soon as we can. Go and find, go and see Brewpeg. <laughs> so for me, I'm quite, um, let's say, I'm quite sensitive, right? So I get like, I, I care what people think and I shouldn't, but I do. And um, when I moved into the van first, um, I got quite a lot of people saying that it was a stupid idea. Um, they gave me like six weeks and they were like, you won't last the winter and you won't do this and you won't do that. And it's been just just over 12 months. So that kind of initial kind of burst of people saying, you can't do that, you can't do this. And after I was in the van for a little while and I was looking at boats, everyone was like, you're mad, you can't just buy a boat, what are you thinking? Uh, and then I bought the boat and all of a sudden now that the videos are kind of starting to get some traction my friends are starting to see the boat actually being kind of progressing quite well that they're more like okay <laughs> you know this isn't as crazy as we thought um, but like that said I have some really really supportive friends like my close friends are unbelievably supportive um, but it's more the people outside of that and um, the YouTube comments as well they get to me sometimes and they shouldn't they can be quite uh, yeah, they can be quite abrasive, <laughs> but uh, I'm learning to ignore those. <laughs> I found the block button on YouTube, that was good. <laughs> oh, like, I, I say it, and I've said it before and I say it again, there is no way in hell I would have that boat anywhere near where it is now without people helping and without the amount of support from my friends I've got. Nearly every weekend that I've had, since, since the weather's got better, <laughs> nearly every single weekend I've been on the boat, I've had at least three people helping me. And like without that, there is no way in hell I would be as far along as I am. And I've also got a really, 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 really great girlfriend as well. That's just she just she bought it into the dream, and she's full steam ahead. And she's buying a sewing machine, and she's going making all the cushion covers, and she's learning how to make sails and stuff. So like I couldn't have kind of struck out any better, you know. So without without all those things being in place, I I think I wouldn't be as far along as I am. No way. So, um, most of my friends, really, I'd say 80% of people that have helped me are my friend, very close friends. Um, the other 20% have actually been YouTube people that have sent me emails and live locally or have just turned up to give me a hand. And like, I met one guy, Simon, um, who's in a lot of, a few of my videos and I actually gave his nephew my other boat. So I made really good friends with them and Simon's just been a massive amount of help. Um, so I've made some great friends out of it too. And with regards to qualifications, like it depends on the work. So I have lists, I have tons of, li I like planning. So I have lists, I have lists of skilled jobs and jobs that you don't need to have necessary, have specific skills. Um, and I had loads of people come down and just cleared off that unskilled list. 
that let me just tear away on the smaller, on the kind of annoying engine jobs or packing the stern rudder or the rudder gland or things like that. Um, for the next maybe year, I'll probably be looking for people who have skills in joinery um, and things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I've just been super lucky with help. Like, I can't believe how much support I've had. It's actually just been mind blowing. If you go on my channel uh, or even left, leave a comment on the channel, I can send you my email address. And um, that's actually how I ended up going to visit Acon to Arabella, Alex and Steve. I commented on one of the videos. I kind of was half joking. I said, I've got to call out and see you and uh, give you a hand on the boat. And they were like, yeah, all right, here's your email. If you're serious, give her some mail. So then I made friends with Alex on Facebook. And then all of a sudden I booked flights and I was going over to, uh, <laughs> over to Massachusetts. So like anybody who's a bit mad or anybody who's a bit interested in doing some work, then they can, more, they can absolutely come down and help. The psychological aspect of it was quite difficult. Um, it's all well and good being able to plan and kind of sit down and make a plan and write it all out and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But when push comes to shove and you actually have the money on your hand and there's a boat there that you could have, and basically there is no turning back after you hand that money over, that was really scary. Like, I had to really think about that. And usually I just go, fuck it, I'll do it. But I, could, I had to think about that. But when I did it, I, I felt really, it's a really weird feeling that just washed over me was like, okay, that's my, this is my new purpose. This is what I'm doing and it has to happen. Everything else now is on the outside of that. So in a way, you have to be a little bit selfish and that's also been a bit of a challenge. Is like, I haven't seen my friends very much uh, for the last six months unless they've been down at the boat. So like, you know, that's been a bit of a challenge as well. And you know, so there's, there's a lot of challenges, but every single challenge I've, that I have overcome has been massively rewarding. So it's, it's worth doing in so many levels. I think the biggest challenge is going to be now there's a lot of excitement around the boat and it's going to be in the water and it's going to be all new and everything's going to be fresh and ready to go. But there's going to be a really long, probably 12 or 15 month slog now between now and getting the boat to a point that like it can be used effectively. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a little bit of a slog for the next for the next 12 months. I think that's going to be challenging psychologically, just being able to go there after work every day, getting some work done, progressing, progressing, progressing. Um, you know, I think that's where a lot of projects fall down is people don't understand that these things can actually take quite a long time. And um, if you don't have the goal and the kind of the keep yourself going, that, that can be a huge challenge. So I'm hoping that that won't be a problem, but I don't think it, I don't think it will be. Girlfriend, Niamh, absolutely, no question. Um, unless she decides to get rid of me before then. But um, I, um, any of my friends, anybody who's worked on the boat, I've said it to them, anybody who's done any work on the boat has an open pass to come and stay with me wherever I am. Um, I have a feeling I'll have a flush or a flurry of people staying with me in the Canaries, but as it go, go a little bit further west, it's gonna be a little bit harder for people to join me. But um, I, don't, I don't see myself having strangers on board because it'll be such a small kind of uh, a boat and you know it'll be like a family boat. So I don't see myself kind of inviting people on board from just anywhere. But uh, close friends and family will be will be with me too. Yes, I'd absolutely do it all over again. If 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 it was all taken off me now and I had to start again, I would. Um, I think it would take quite a lot for me to stop now at this stage. And I'm not I'm not I was kind of pretty early on in the project to to know whether I do anything differently. Um, I don't think I'd do anything differently. Um, knowing what I know now, I could do it again a lot quicker. But when I started, I was still very much a novice. Um, I think the only thing I would do differently is I'd learn to weld earlier. That's the only thing I'd do differently. Because there were a few jobs that I wasn't comfortable doing. There were a few holes, holes in the hull um, that I didn't feel comfortable doing because I didn't have the skills. Um, I would like to have done those myself and you know, not had to rely on other people kind of taking their time, time out of their huge projects to do it. Um, but going forward now, anything on deck, I'll be doing myself because it's not massively structural, any of the vents or anything like that. Um, but it's structural welding that I'm not very particularly very good at yet. So have a really, really good think about it. Um, make sure that anybody who's close to you and anybody who's kind of your significant partner or significant, significant kind of dependent or anything is on board as well. I mean, I have Neve, right? They're in, on board all from day one, right? So I think that if you had a partner that wasn't fully into it and kind of you know, make sure that they understand the scope of the project and what it's going to take because it's 
it pushed it puts a lot of pressure on uh, relationships and if I didn't have Neve I think that uh, yeah I think that I think I'd be a little bit more lonely because <laughs> I don't think any other girlfriend would put up with this <laughs> I mean I'm living in a van I wash in the sea so on the weekends and <laughs> Um, so say we'll start from Monday. So Monday morning, uh, eight o'clock, I go to work and I work till about, well, I got out of work today at seven, but usually it's half four to five o'clock. Um, then I go up to my garage, I rent a small unit, um, where I keep my tools and I keep my bench and my workshop. Um, and that's about 25 minutes from work. So I'll go up there after work and I'll, um, do a few small bits of bits and bobs in the shed or I'll make some video. Um, or I'll talk to some of my friends online, like uh, Damien and Ryan. I speak to them all the time. And um, I probably go to bed around maybe one o'clock in the morning. And then um, I'll get up and do the same thing Tuesday through Friday. I'll spend some evenings sailing. I'll spend some evenings maybe doing a bit of uh, a bit of video work and stuff. But um, mo mainly during the week, I kind of just focus on doing small jobs that I can't do on the weekends. And then Friday evening around three o'clock, I get down to the boat for maybe four or five. So I leave work at three, I get to the boat at five o'clock. And um, I'll just, I'll have a list. I basically have a list Saturday and Sunday. These are the jobs you have to get done before you leave the boat on Sunday night, which I never finish. <laughs> and um, I throw my time at the boat and I kind of, you know, whoever's with me, I keep them busy and, you know, I'll, I'll have maybe a pizza on Saturday night and have a, go to sleep early maybe and try and get up fresh on Sunday. And it's pretty much just work both, work both, work both, work both. And then, um, and I, when I, sometimes I crash and I have to sleep for like 12 hours, but yeah, it's, it's going okay so far. Thank you for watching. I'm sure you find Reese just as inspiring as I do. And if you're not already subscribed to his channel, you can do that. It's uh, Frantic Sailing Adventures. And uh, if you want to support Reese monetarily, you can purchase a challenge coin. They sell for $20 and $15 of that proceeds goes to Reese and the, supporting the, uh, the refit of Zora. And uh, next up in this series is uh, Alex and Steve with Acorn to Arabella. Come back and join us for that. Thank you.